This video reviews the ABCDE principles in which each letter stands for a different feature that can be useful in distinguishing potentially malignant pigmented lesions from more benign pigmented lesions. In the final part of the video, we'll review a clinical histological correlation for melanoma and then talk briefly about the four main subtypes of melanoma. In this video, I want to start off where we left off in the last video and now give you a more systematic way to help you clinically differentiate benign nevi from more potentially malignant lesions like dysplastic nevi and melanoma. So it turns out that there's a very easy to remember mnemonic that helps dermatologists, primary care doctors, and even patients more systematically be able to differentiate benign pigmented lesions from more malignant pigmented lesions. And this mnemonic is known as the ABCDE mnemonic. And as you can see, each letter stands for a different characteristic. And each of these characteristics are essentially red flags that clue us into a potentially malignant process that might be going on in a pigmented lesion. Now, of course, one of the caveats to using such a simple framework like this is that not all dysplastic nevi or melanoma are going to have A, B, C, D, or E characteristics. However, because this is such an easy mnemonic to keep at the back of your mind, if you do come across a pigmented lesion with one or more of these red flag features, it's worth a second look, either by getting a trained eye to take another look, or even potentially taking a biopsy, a sample of the lesion to look at histologically. All right, so now I think the best way to cement these A, B, C, D, E features into your mind is to go through each of these in turn. So let's go ahead and start with A for asymmetry. So starting off here on the right with this malignant melanoma, if we were to draw a line of potential symmetry through this lesion, you could already note that both sides of this lesion don't look identical. Essentially, if we flipped the lesion onto itself, it would not be a perfect match. And so therefore we say this lesion is exhibiting a high degree of asymmetry. This is in contrast to the benign nevi on the left side of the image. Notice that if we were to draw a line of potential symmetry down each of these lesions, there's essentially almost perfect symmetry. Now the dysplastic nevus in the center is somewhere in between. So if we were to draw a line of potential symmetry here, we can see that it's slightly more symmetrical than the malignant melanoma, but there are also regions of the lesion that wouldn't match perfectly with the other side. So it's slightly more asymmetrical than the benign nevi. Now moving on, B stands for borders, and we want to make sure that we don't miss out on any irregular borders in a pigmented lesion. So going back to our malignant melanoma, notice here how the borders of this lesion are extremely irregular, which is in direct contrast to the kind of well demarcated borders that you can see here for all the types of benign nevi. Now once again, the dysplastic nevus in the center of the image is somewhere in between. So notice here how the borders are fairly regular, but ever so slightly more irregular than we saw for the benign nevi. The next thing to be aware of is the color of the lesion, and specifically, the red flag feature is color variation within a lesion. So I want to remind you, if we go back to these benign nevi, notice how each of these nevi are different colors from each other, which is due to the fact that the melanin that the melanocytes are producing are at different levels within the skin. However, within each lesion, notice that the color is pretty homogeneous. This is in contrast to what we see for the malignant melanoma where we have patches of very dark pigment and then also patches of lighter pigment. And so it's this color variation that is a red flag that can signal a potentially malignant process. Now you can also know that there's some slight color variation in this dysplastic nevus here in the center, but to a lesser degree than what we're seeing for the melanoma here at the far right. Now, if you do identify color variation in a pigmented lesion, there are three colors that are particularly worrisome, and those are red, white, and blue, the colors of the American flag. Red is worrisome because it can indicate irritation or inflammation in the region of the lesion, which can often accompany melanoma. White is also a worrisome color, and just to give you an idea of what this looks like, if we go back to our melanoma here on the right, notice here that there are areas of white patches within the lesion. This is a phenomenon called regression. Essentially what's happening is that the body is mounting an immune response in response to the atypical cancerous melanocytes. And so these areas of white essentially represent areas that have been scarred over by the underlying inflammation. 
Finally, another color to keep your eye out for is the color blue. And the reason is, is because melanin deep within the dermis can actually appear almost a bluish hue clinically. And this is due to the fact that shorter wavelengths of light in the blue-violet spectrum are scattered by collagen bundles in the dermis, thus making the lesion look a little bit blue. We don't have any areas of blue pigment for me to show you here in the melanoma, but what I will say is the reason this is worrisome is that if there's a bluish color, it suggests that there's melanin deep within the dermis, which suggests then that there's atypical melanocytes that are potentially invading the dermis as well, thus kind of suggesting there might be a malignant process going on. So moving on, D stands for diameter, and the big idea with this is that the bigger the lesion, the more worrisome it is. And this kind of size cutoff that has been established is that lesions greater than six millimeters deserve a second look. And this size cutoff comes from studies that have shown an acceptable level of sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of melanoma. One thing to keep at the back of your mind is that six millimeters is about the size of a head of an eraser on a pencil. So if you see pigmented lesions that are bigger than that, it might deserve a second look. Finally, let's talk about the last feature of a potential dysplastic nevi or melanoma which is E for evolution, and this refers to any change that occurs in the lesion. It can be a change in size, change in color, change in symptom. For example, some patients might say that a pigmented lesion started itching or bleeding, and so all of this means that we can't judge evolution by simply looking at a lesion at one time point. It's important either to document how the lesion change, changes over time through photographs, and or ask the patient about any changes that they've noticed over a period of time. All right, so now that we've showcased these A, B, C, D, E features on gross clinical images, the next thing I want to do is make some histological clinical correlations and remind you that many of these features, these A, B, C, D, E features, have a basis in what's going on histologically. Just as a quick side note, I want to mention that the reason I put E in parentheses here is that evolution, remember, is something that we can't really see in one histological or one clinical image, it's something that we would need to track over time. With that said, we're going to focus on making clinical histological correlations for the A, B, C, and D characteristics, specifically of a malignant melanoma. And to do this, we're going to start off with a gross clinical image and then compare it side by side to its histology. So here I'm going to go ahead and bring up a malignant melanoma. Notably, this lesion has A, B, C, and D characteristics. So starting off with asymmetry, if we were to draw a line of potential symmetry, you can note the marked asymmetry in the lesion. This lesion also has some irregular borders and also has some color variation within the lesion. And notably, if we were to approximate the diameter, it's almost approximately about 10 millimeters or so, which is greater than the six millimeter cutoff. So all of these are red flag features that clue us into the fact that this is likely a melanoma. Now before we jump into an H&E histological stain, I want to go ahead and bring up again the cartoon image of a melanoma to actually remind you of all the asymmetry and irregularity in the melanocyte nests and how they're arranged in the skin. And this is directly reflected in the asymmetry and border irregularity that we saw in the gross clinical lesion. So with that said, so let's go ahead and take a look at the actual H&E stain. So here it is, and just to orient you once again, up at the top in this darker purple is the epidermis. The very top represents the stratum corneum up here, and kind of below that is the remainder of the epidermis. And then in this lighter pink color is the dermis. Admittedly, there's a lot going on in this image, but one of my fail-safe ways to approach histology is to ask myself what cell type primarily looks abnormal. And in this case, notice that we have clusters of cells that are producing what seems to be some light brown pigment and also some dark brown pigment, like I'm circling up here in the stratum corneum. And all of these cells represent atypical melanocytes that are proliferating in areas that they shouldn't be. In fact, there are also some clusters of pigment producing cells down here in the dermis as well. And so all of this together highlights that there's a malignant melanoma. In fact, we can also see another histological hallmark of melanoma in this image. I'm circling here a cluster of what looks like to be inflammatory cells, most likely lymphocytes owing from their kind of prominent blue nuclei here. And remember that an inflammatory infiltrate often accompanies melanoma. Essentially, the body's trying to mount an immune response against the invading atypical melanocytes. 
Now one more clinical histological correlation that I want to make with this image is that notice that the clusters of melanocytes are all producing differing amounts of pigment. Some are producing lots of pigment, some are producing kind of a medium amount of pigment, and some are producing very little pigment. And this variation in the amount of pigment that these atypical melanocytes produce correlates with the color variation that we often see in the growth clinical appearances of these lesions. And with that, let's go ahead and wrap up our discussion of the histological clinical correlations for melanoma. And in the final part of the video, I want to walk you through the four main subtypes of melanoma. Notably, the subtypes of melanoma have been classified based on clinical and histological features and don't give us much more added prognostic value. In other words, knowing one subtype from another doesn't give us much more prognostic information. In fact, the most important prognostic factor is independent of subtype and is something called the Breslow thickness, which essentially measures the depth of invading melanocytes. However, for diagnostic purposes, it can be helpful to be aware of the four main subtypes of melanoma. So for that reason, let's go through each of these subtypes briefly in turn. So starting here on the left with superficial spreading melanoma, this is the most common type of melanoma. It accounts for about 60 to 70% of all melanomas and typically appears as a pigmented plaque. And as you can see in this particular melanoma, there's an area of central regression in the middle of the lesion. And superficial spreading melanoma, if caught early, can have a good prognosis because it often has an early horizontal growth phase of atypical melanocytes, which is confined to that dermal epidermal junction, and so can potentially be excised with margins and have a good prognosis. The next subtype is nodular melanoma, and this image might look familiar to you because it's the melanoma we did the histological clinical correlation for earlier, and it looks exactly like what it sounds like. It essentially contains a raised area, a raised pigmented area that looks like a nodule. And unfortunately for these types of melanoma, there's a poorer prognosis usually than the superficial spreading melanomas. And this is due to the fact that there's often an early vertical growth phase of atypical mel melanocytes into the underlying dermis. The next subtype that I've brought up here is a lentigo maligna melanoma. And these often appear as pigmented macules, oftentimes in the elderly. And they can be very insidious, but if they're caught early, they can have a good prognosis because they, like the superficial spreading melanomas, also have an early horizontal growth phase. And then finally, the last main subtype of melanoma is the acral lentiginous melanoma. And acral simply refers to the fact that these melanomas are found on acral surfaces, like the fingers, the toes, the feet, the hands, or even the nail beds. And in this case, the melanoma that's being highlighted here is on the bottom of someone's foot near the individual's heel. As you can imagine, these types of melanomas, given their unique location, can be easy to miss. But one point to recognize epidemiologically is that it turns out in African and Asian populations, the proportion of melanomas that are acral is much higher than in any other population. So especially for individuals from these populations, it's important to screen for acral melanomas. And so with that, we come to the end of our video, and I hope now you feel a little bit more confident distinguishing benign from potentially more malignant pigmented lesions, and you're also able to appreciate the clinical histological correlations for melanoma.